It is my profound pleasure tonight to introduce our keynote speaker for the conference. Um, Susan Jacoby is an esteemed author, or is the esteemed author of the 2008 New York Times best-selling book, The Age of American Unreason, which tackles the issues associated with American anti-intellectualism. She began her career for, as a reporter for the Washington Post and has since been a contributor to a variety of national publications, including the, the New York Times, the Los, An Los Angeles Times, the American Prospect, Mother Jones, and The Nation. She has been interviewed by Stephen Colbert and participated in debates against the likes of Dinesh D'Souza and others. <laughs> she has written 10 books in total, including The Age of American Unreason, Free Thinkers, A History of American Secularism, and The Great Agnostic, Robert Ingersoll and, the, and American Free Thought. She currently lives in New York City, where she works as a program director for the New York branch of the Center for Inquiry. <laughs> well, you're in luck, because I was just about to wrap up. Please give a warm Free Thought Festival welcome uh, for Susan Jacoby. Uh, well, first, I would like to thank Sam for being a real nudge, which she really was, and getting me here, in spite of the months of anxiety caused by my hearing weather reports from Wisconsin. Uh, uh, which, of course, when I arrived yesterday, it seemed like it never happened. Uh, second, although this speech is titled The Conscience of a Freethinker, to accommodate you know, everyone who is actually an atheist but doesn't like to say so because the word is such a pejorative, or for whatever reason, the speech is going out in the world for the rest of its life on the speaker's podium this year as the conscience of an atheist. So I'm going to use the A word and the F for freethinker word interchangeably from now on, since everything I have to say on this subject applies to atheists, humanists, agnostics, secularists, free thinkers, and whatever else we choose to call ourselves. I actually wrote this speech in January. It was my new speech for this year. Uh, just a few days after the terrorist attacks in Paris on the magazine Charlie Hebdo and on a kosher supermarket where I have actually been. Uh, that was creepy. I remember that in addition to being upset by the news itself, which obviously everyone was, I was equally upset, really outraged, by the news coverage in which so many journalists, American journalists in particular, seemed to feel obliged to say that the cartoons published in the satirical magazine Charlie are vulgar and deeply offensive to religious Muslims, but of course that doesn't justify the killing of those cartoonists. Uh, I wasn't going to get to this till later in the speech, but part of the conscience of a free thinker or an atheist or a humanist or all three is that people don't get killed for exercising their right to free speech, regardless of how much it offends and whom it offends. You, you fight free speech with more free speech, in my view, and I think that that is important to the conscience and the worldview of free thinkers. Just a few weeks ago, I wrote a piece for the Sunday op-ed section of the New York Times. It was titled, The First Victims of the First Crusade. This was actually written after President Obama took it on the chin for mentioning the religious violence of the Crusades and the Inquisition at the National Prayer Breakfast, a sanctimonious institution about which less said the better, dating from, by the way, the venerable year of 1954. A lot of people think that these things have always been around, but they haven't in America. In any case, this little article was an excerpt from one chapter in my forthcoming book about religious conversion, and it compared the early 12th century Hebrew and Christian chronicles of the First Crusade, in which the first victims were European Jews, whom the Crusaders practiced on with recreational pogroms on their way to Jerusalem to take on the Muslims. Uh, and I compared these old chronicles with the news accounts of what ISIS terrorists had done to both Christians and Muslims. Muslims who don't subscribe to their particular 8th century mindset. Uh, the Crusaders were Christian terrorists in their murders of Jews, just as the people who murder doctors who perform abortions today are right-wing Christian terrorists. This does not mean that all Christians are terrorists. Any more than calling Islamic terrorism Islamic terrorism means that most Muslims approve of terrorism or groups like ISIS. What it all means is that absolutist brand 
hands of religion have been responsible for horrendous violence throughout history, whatever religion. Absolute religious truth claims can no longer be applied in civil society in the West because they've been checked, though it took more than 800 years from the beginning of the Crusades. They've been checked by Renaissance humanism, by various religious reformations, and above all, by the Enlightenment and the separation of church and state. For the people who are trying to dignify themselves by calling themselves an Islamic state, the last millennium might as well not have happened. I open with this because I think that calling things by their right names is part of the conscience of a free thinker. In my experience, and this was discussed by several panels this morning, the question most frequently asked of atheists in one form or another is how can there be any morality without religion? Uh, this putative question is really an accusation, meaning if you don't believe in religion, you believe in nothing, so there's nothing to prevent you from doing anything. Of course, this is only another version of Dostoevsky's famous formulation that without God, everything is permitted. I never encountered this big question personally until Freethinkers, A History of American Secularism was published in 2004. I was being interviewed by Michael Medved, uh, one of the many Jewish neoconservatives who rediscovered his inner Orthodox Jew along with Ayn Rand as part of his flight from the 60s. And he asked me directly, what's to stop you from committing murder if you don't believe in God, as someone mentioned on one of the panels this morning. I must admit I was flummoxed because, partly because Freethinkers, which devotes most of its attention to the 18th century, has very little to say about atheism. The numerous secularists among the revolutionary founders were not atheists but deists, although deists were often called atheists by their antagonists. But the truth is, the question just seems so ridiculous to me that I blurted out, you know, that I have to say that murder's just never been on my list of life experiences I want to have have before I die. And, and it's true, you know, like everyone who's ever been in love, uh, I, the words I'd like to kill you have undoubtedly, I'm sorry to say, escaped my lips at times. But truly, I only meant it in the spirit of a six-year-old saying to her little brother, I wish you were dead. I may have felt strongly enough to voice the sentiment at the time, but I certainly had no intention of actually doing anything to make it happen. Really, I swear on the origin of species. Uh, one of the many mistakes of Catholic theology, and I was raised a Catholic, is equating a thought with a deed. What's to prevent me from killing anyone, apart from a distaste for blood shared by everyone who isn't a psychopath, is, is plain and simple human empathy. Uh, I wouldn't like anyone to kill me, and so I can imagine how you would feel if I tried to kill you. It would probably hurt, and at the very least it would mean the extinction of the consciousness that makes us human. Uh, what people of extreme or absolutist faith generally mean when they talk about the incompatibility of morality and atheism is that atheism makes it more difficult for them to impose their particular brand of religion-based morality on everyone else. Uh, for instance, all societies, religious and non-religious, do indeed have prohibitions against murder. They have them for the reason all, they have already mentioned, that being murdered is not pleasant for anyone. But the murder prohibition also exists because revenge killing is not an effective way of settling disputes that crop up in any human environment. Settling feuds by blood vengeance only leads to more, and that, not any particular form of belief in a supernatural being who rewards and punishes is the reason we have human laws and human punishments for murder. If fear of God alone could keep human beings from committing murder, we wouldn't need earthly laws and earthly courts. That's why Justice Antonin Scalia is so horribly wrong when he talks about all power coming from God. There wouldn't be any need for Justice Scalia, whether there is or not, if people wouldn't commit murders and do bad things just because they fear God's justice. Ugh. Many people's, most people's violent impulses are kept in check by hardwired empathy. But for those who lie beyond the circle and they exist in every society, there have to be laws forbidding assault and murder. And that applies to both religious psychos and atheist psychos. But although every society prohibits murder, 
A problem arises because societies define murder in very different ways. We've seen this for a long time in the abortion debate in the United States. If abortion is murder, as the religious right contends, then it ought to be illegal. But many people, both religious and non-religious, do not consider abortion murder because they do not consider embryos or fetuses human beings with the legal rights of, n of born persons. We see exactly the same definitional problem in the debate over physician-assisted suicide and the right to die. If human beings have no right to decide in any circumstances, whatever their quality of life is, to end their own lives, then of course ph physician-assisted suicide is murder. Unassisted mur suicide is murder too, literally self-murder. The idea that only God has the right to decide when it's time for his creatures to die is rooted in every monotheistic religion. It is the reason a Christian who killed himself or herself could not be buried in consecrated ground until ministers got a lot kinder in the 20th century. But as an atheist and a humanist, I do believe that people have the right to determine the conditions under which they will continue to exist at certain points in their lives. To turn to yet another moral definitional question about murder, killing in combat is generally not considered murder. Murder, though some religious groups like Quaker, Quakers disagree. One of the most common mistakes people make in everyday speech, and a lot of people made it today on various panels, is equating morality or morals with goodness. Morality is a neutral term. In Alice in Wonderland, the Duchess says to Alice, tut tut my dear, everything's got a moral if only you can find it. And there are many forms of morality that are based on what I consider pure evil. So when religious people assert that there can be no morality without religion, what many of them mean is there can be no morality of which they approve without the dominance of their religion. You might as well ask whether there can be morality with religion. Because the world's great religions disagree sharply on a wide variety of moral and ethical questions, and there is much disagreement within religions on moral and ethical questions. The truth is there's no such thing. I hate this such and such has nothing to do with the real Islam or such and such, they said after my piece, the Crusades had nothing to do with the real Christianity. Of course they did. That's ridiculous. They didn't have to do with all Christians or all Muslims. Not then. I imagine there were a lot of farmers in Europe who were pretty unhappy to see those marauding young men. You know, you're sitting there tilling your field, you know, bringing your children up, and suddenly these young men with nothing to do but kill people, they got all these months to, to go, go on the way to the Holy Land. They've got to find something to do. They've got nothing to eat. They're going to eat your food. Of course these things have to do with religion in the sense that they have to do with particular interpretations of religion, which is not to say that all religions endorse these things or that all or even most people endorse these things, but they do have something to do with religion. If religions disagree about something as fundamental to human order as what constitutes a murder, one can hardly expect any religion to be the last word on such relatively less important matters as usury and sodomy. For that, we need secular laws based on long experience of what people People do and don't need to be protected from in order to live decent lives. You might well ask why I'm beginning a talk titled The Conscience of an Atheist or of a Freethinker with a Discussion of Law. But I think law is an expression of our collective conscience, that is, governing those matters on which in a democratic society enough people agree to enact a public prohibition. And laws that give expression to this collective conscience change as public opinion changes, as we've seen most recently in the shift attitudes toward gay rights and gay marriage, as well as marijuana. Now, what the religious right in this country says is that laws on gay rights can never be changed by human opinion because they are God's laws laid down for his own reasons that reason knows nothing up of. When you talk about this with fundamentalists of whatever faith, the first thing they hurl at you is another term of opprobrium after they've finished asking you what's to stop you from committing murder. They, they call you a moral relativist. 
I think that there are many atheists who don't fully understand what certain believers think about moral relativism. This is very well explained in a book I highly recommend to you by my friend Rebecca Goldstein. It's a novel titled 36 Arguments for the Existence of God. In one chapter, Goldstein depicts a a fictional debate between a believer and her hero named Cass Seltzer, who has written a book called The Varieties of Religious Illusion and has been described by Time Magazine as, quote, the atheist with a soul. I love that, by the way. It's so Time Magazine, past and present. <laughs> anyway, the religious believer in the debate flatly says to Seltzer, quote, there is simply no way an atheist can be able to claim any sort of objective morality. Cass Seltzer spoke of the tragedy of a child being exterminated by the absolute evil it was Nazism. But how, coming from his worldview, can he possibly maintain there's anything like absolute evil? It's on the basis of the evil in this world that he argues that our world yields empirical evidence against God's existence. But the distinction between good and evil can be maintained only on the basis of God. According to the Nazi system, it was perfectly okay to send that child to his death. And without God, who Who's to say that the Nazis were wrong, unquote? This is a, this is a wonderful passage which, uh, which really embodies this kind of thinking. And the problem with this argument is, is it never deals with the question of exactly how a human being gets to know God's will, that higher authority that judges between different moral systems. I'm sorry, and that was a wonderful panel about religion and morality this morning, but, but the fact that you were taught something by your parents does not mean, or, or by a rabbi, or by an imam, does not mean that you know any more, in fact, than I can tell you I know there is no God. I can only say that on the basis of what I see and what I think, I think it's very unlikely. It's no one else is ever around when God actually talks to people, whether it's directly from the burning bush or indirectly as when the angel Moroni appeared to Joseph Smith a few thousand years later in upstate New York and handed down the Book of Mormon. Uh, nobody else ever saw the Book of Mormon, including his wife. Uh, the reasons are always what people say God's reasons are, just as the reasoning behind secular morality is formulated by people. The difference is that an atheist is willing to admit it. What I'm revealing in my critique of this response in one sense is that I am not a philosopher. I'm interested not much interested in logic about supposedly independent reasons of supernatural beings or even so much of secular thought systems. Show me a picture of Moroni descending from the sky and flying off before there was any mechanical way to fly and maybe I'll consider your independent godly reason. At least I would have considered it before Photoshop. Now. <laughs> Plato's allegory of the cave makes sense, as opposed, let us say, to some of the German philosophical effusions of the 19th century, because it proceeds not from an ab abstraction, but from a natural phenomenon, one's limited vision in a cave that can be understood by anyone. All moral arguments boil down to one person's value system against another's. And that doesn't make them any less serious or consequential than moral arguments conducted by one group of people claiming to speak for one God against another group of people claiming to speak for another God. Now, what I should have asked Mr. Medved, it's so wonderful to think about what you should have said, but you weren't quick-witted enough to say at the time, was what's to stop you from committing murder if your God orders it? He's done it in the past. In fact, he did it at the founding of your religion. And of course, the answer is that Abraham would have gone ahead and murdered Isaac if God, that prankster, hadn't recanted at the last minute and said, I didn't really mean it. I just wanted to see if you'd do it. I was just kidding. The story of Abraham is reason enough for my reservations about the good without God campaign that many atheists and humanists organize, usually around Christmas. There is certainly no more reason I should have to prove to anyone that I can be good without God as there is for anyone to prove to me that they can be good with God, that they're no blind follower like Abraham. I'm quite willing to accept that most religious believers aren't Abraham, to take it on faith, really, if they don't take it upon themselves to 
ask me to explain why I'm not a murderer because I don't believe in God. None of these observations, however, address themselves to the question of how the conscience of an atheist is or is not formed. I should say that I am not a moral relativist if this term means what it usually does, someone who believes in no moral absolutes. When I said just said that moral disagreements are always disagreements between groups of people, I didn't mean that some of those people aren't right and some of them aren't wrong. The statement that according to the Nazi system, what the Nazi system did was perfectly okay is meaningless because the Nazi system, its concept of human beings and the proper relationship between the state and human beings was absolutely evil. And not because there is a God who said to, but allows it to go on anyway because his creatures supposedly have free will, but because anyone who isn't a psycho can see that the killing of dozens or hundreds or thousands, or in this case, millions of human beings, is absolutely wrong, regardless of what any ideological system, religious or secular, says about its being right. How do we know this? We know it simply by opening our eyes and seeing the pain and suffering of the damned. So the first essential point about the conscience of an atheist is it is formed by natural means, by observation and experience. It cannot contradict the laws of nature uh, by being based on what is unseen, unexperienced, and therefore insupportable. To paraphrase David Hume, extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. That people are capable of looking in pain and suffering and doing nothing about it, sometimes for centuries and millennia, is an example of the interference of religion and ideology with a conscience based on naturalism. Slavery, a human institution that significant numbers of educated people began to question only 300 years ago, is certainly the perfect example. Anyone with a brain and eyes to see can see that people of different colors from different parts of the earth are all human beings, walking upright on two legs, possessing the gift of language, capable of communicating their suffering through that gift of nature. Yet all of the sacred books of the major monotheistic religions, written as they were millennia or centuries ago, justify the practice of slavery. And this religious justification interfered for all that time with the, I believe, natural perception that this slave I own is in fact another human being. Now, it's also true that there are writings in the same sacred books that can be used against slavery, but it took centuries of human progress, much of it involving the realization that these so-called divine books were in fact written by human beings. And so the meaning of the passages is not, you should use the expression, written in stone. It took millennia for enough people to begin questioning the notion that some human beings have dominion over others, as God was said to have given man dominion over the birds of the air and the beasts of the field, something that isn't quite as self-evident as a lot of us thought it was when I was young. And of course there are secular ideologies, and I do want to mention this because this is also another question that atheists always get asked. It's the Stalin question. There are secular ideologies that bear the distinguishing mark of religion, which is imperviousness to evidence. Communism, as it was practiced under Stalin, was in fact the equivalent of a religion. Uh, one of the best examples of it is what was called Lysenkoist biology. Stalin had a crackpot biologist named Trofim Lysenko who insisted it was possible to alter human beings genetically to shape a Soviet man by changing their social conditions. In other words, by having people read Das Kapital instead of the Bible, you could genetically change their brains. Uh, scientists and agronomists who insisted on maintaining their loyalty to Mendelian genetics during the Stalin and era were sent to the gulag, and Soviet medicine and agriculture were set back three generations. A part of the brand of Marxism practiced under Stalin was imperviousness to scientific evidence. In the same way that Christianity is impervious to what I think is probative evidence, that human beings do not rise from their graves. Uh, anytime 
an ideology brooks no evidence-based challenge, whether it's secular or religious, it is, it has the characteristics of religion. And uh, the same thing is true, uh, the same thing of, is true of observations about what religion has said about women. As the great Elizabeth Cady Stanton once said, what power is it that makes the Hindu women burn herself upon the funeral pyre of her husband, her religion? What holds the Turkish woman in the harem, her religion? Man of himself could not do this, but when he declares, thus saith the Lord, of course he can do it. So long as the ministers stand up and tell us that Christ is the head of the church, so is man the head of woman. How are we to break the chains that which have held women down through the ages? So the essential precept of the conscience of an atheist is that all beliefs and conclusions are subject to ev evidentiary challenge. If someone does a double-blind study on the possibility of, of resurrection and can prove to me that the formerly dead are alive and appearing on both Fox News and MSNBC, well, I'll have to revise my conclusions about life after death. I'm open to that. The premise that all conclusions are open to evidentiary challenge is not a form of relativism, because the fact that there is much we don't know is just that, a fact. It's not a belief. We know a lot more, infinitely more, for example, about humanity's genetic makeup than we did in 1945, the year I was born. Before DNA was unraveled, for example, we knew that some diseases were inherited, based both on the observation that certain diseases seem to run in families and on inspired guesses, uh, which is how Mendel started out before he did the actual research on his peas. But we didn't really understand how genetic inheritance worked, so the possibility of intervention was nil. And some of the things we thought about what was and was not inherited were right, and some were wrong. Before the breaking of the genetic code, for instance, we didn't have an idea of what was genetically transmitted and what happened, for instance, as the result of something that went wrong during pregnancy, which is not genetically transmitted. Even something as basic and related to heredity as height, as we now know, had every bit as much to do with nutrition as with genetics. Uh, height, height doesn't make somebody who is six feet tall, uh, the, the gene for height isn't going to make them 6'10", but in fact we've seen in the second half of the 20th century that it's added several inches better nutrition to everybody's height. Uh, Inevitably, our knowledge of what is and is not genetically inherited has changed our views on moral and legal responsibility. No reasonable person or court, for example, can assign full moral responsibility for an impulsive crime to somebody who has Huntington's disease, a genetic disorder which is characterized by violent impulsiveness in the middle stages before the person loses all mental control and is incapable of doing anything. The second most important premise in the conscience of an atheist, in my view, is that all of us who do not suffer from pathological mental diseases have to act as if we had free will regardless of whether we really do. And I know that many of you in the audience may not agree with me about this, and there are quite a few atheists who disagree with me about this, which is why this talk is titled The Conscience of an Atheist and not The Conscience of the Atheist. My friend Sam Harris has been writing a good deal about this on his blog, and there is no question that neurobiological research is beginning to suggest that our wills are somewhat more circumscribed than any of us like to think. Uh, but in terms of the moral issues that we confront every day in our own lives and in the collective life of our society, the scope of perceived free will is so broad that I think it almost renders the question meaningless in a practical sense. Uh, it is certainly true that the notion that we have no free will in the very broadest biological sense is as deep a wound to the human ego as Darwin's theory of evolution was in the 19th century. We all, atheist and religious believer alike, to like to take pride in our concept of ourselves as free agents, able to choose not only between right and wrong, but between good and the greater good, between evil and the lesser evil. Whether this pride is ultimately justified by science doesn't matter, in my view, because we are all obliged to act as if we do have free will in making moral choices. Uh, 
It's rather like the open question of whether human beings are the highest point of evolution or whether there are some creatures out there beyond in the galaxy who are a lot smarter than we are. My knowledge of science at this stage of the 21st century tells me it's actually unlikely that our planet is the only chunk of the universe on which intelligent life has developed. So I can see the scenario of the invasion of the body snatchers being plausible. But it's really not useful for me to keep this in the forefront of my mind and let it influence my actions because there's so much I have to do and that humans have to do as a species whether the body snatchers are on their way here or not. And that's pretty much how I feel about the whole free will issue. Did the Nazis have no free will? It really doesn't matter because we cannot live in our world and permit a system like Nazism to run things, period. Now, I'm also very mindful that the word free, the term free will is the excuse the religious use to justify justify the ways of God to man. It's how they solve the theodicy problem. Yes, God is all powerful and all good, but because he's endowed man with free will, he's off the hook for the Nazis and for anything anybody might do. An atheist doesn't have to let anyone or anything off because we don't believe that the universe is intelligently designed. We have to take things as we find them and exercise our higher intellectual faculties for what we perceive as the good. Of course, that word perceive raises the whole issue of relativism again. But we are all bound by what our senses can perceive and our brains can understand or try to understand. And this is always a moral as an intellectual struggle. And I think in many ways more difficult for an atheist because we can't fall back on a higher authority. I think the most tempting and really beautiful words in the Christian Bible are Paul's. For now we see through a glass darkly, then face to face. Now we know in part Heart, but then we shall know, I shall know, even as I am known. There's an old spiritual that says the same thing. Farther along, we'll know more about it. Farther along, we'll understand why. I can easily understand why this belief provides comfort in the unending ethical dilemmas that life poses. An atheist must make moral decisions without that comfort. Farther along, I don't think I'll know more about anything because I'll be dead. <laughs> The brief span of consciousness that makes up the arc of my human life will be extinguished. What seems to me the third indispensable element in the formation of an atheist conscience is certainly a form of utilitarianism, just as easily expressed in the biblical aphorism, by their fruits ye shall know them, as by John Stuart Mill. Now, Harris and other modern philosophers call this consequentialism. Uh, he acknowledges that basic moral decision only on consequences weighs, raises all sorts of thorny questions. One of these, obviously, is the law of unintended consequences. Try Try as we might, we can never know the full scope of any action taken at any decision at a at a given point in life. Uh, there, there's you know the old the old the old ridiculous dilemma about uh, if a building is burning, if a museum is burning, and there's a baby trapped in it, do you save the Rembrandt self portrait of the baby? Well, my answer to that is get a babysitter before you go to the museum, so you don't have to have this thing. But it's it's uh, the fact is 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 a humanist, yeah, I'd have to say, save the baby. Well, but what if the baby grows up to be Adolf Hitler? Well, you can't know that. That's why you can only make decisions based on what is before you at the time. And what is before you at the time is you save the baby. Uh, the reason I am not a moral relativist is while, although it's certainly possible to see what the consequences are and have been of various, that is that it is perfectly possible to see what the consequences have been of various kinds of moral systems in the past. For example, we can look at the lives of women in theocratic societies and condemn the treatment of women, not only on the basis of enlightenment philosophy and values, but on the basis of the miserable lives that women lead today before our eyes in those societies. Are these societies prosperous? Are either women or men educated enough to enjoy the benefits and standard of living of pe that people in more secular and aka more developed societies enjoy? Does it contribute to personal happiness for a woman to be shut up in the house from childhood, prevented from going to school unless she's brave enough to risk having acid thrown at her, sold in marriage as a young teenager to men who rape her, subject to the death penalty if she falls in love with someone her father has 
and chosen for her. We don't need to know all of the future unintended consequences of this sort of ethical system because we know what the consequences have been so far. That is why I have no use at all for what I consider multiculturalism run amok. For people who say we have no right to make judgments about other cultures and religions. Sure we do. We make judgments about what's been done already, just like, like we make judgments about our own society, about what's been done already, whether it's in Ferguson or New York City or in Madison, Wisconsin or throughout the South. We know what's happening before us. We draw our conclusions from what we have seen. We don't know what tomorrow will bring, though. In the final analysis, though, the irreducible element underlying the conscience of an atheist is our acceptance, again, on the basis of evidence from the national world, natural world that death is the end. This both complicates and simplifies moral moral issues, but I think the understandable human refusal to accept finality is the reason so many atheists, one of the reasons, that so many atheists still prefer to call themselves agnostics. Some famous 19th century freethinkers turned to spiritualism when they could not face what an atheist must face about death. Susan B. Anthony wrote in her diary, if it is true that we die like a flower, leaving behind only the fragrance, what a delusion the race has ever been in. What a dream is the life of man." Unquote. I've never understood this point of view. Less still from a person who do devoted her life, though she didn't live to see the result, to affecting such an important change as gaining the vote for women. The older I get, quite naturally, the more tragic and misguided I consider this view of mor mortality. Oh, even though it is, I dare say, a, a view held by the majority of my countrymen. Uh, what if we do die like a flower, leaving a faint and decidedly transient scent behind? It's much better than leaving a stench behind, even though the stench too is temporary unless it was exuded, unfortunately, by beings of great worldly influence. Whether our actions are remembered on a large stage or for how long and by whom is not the foundation of our reason for trying to live what might be called a good life. The moral rightness of, and wrongness of our actions can no more be evaluated by how they will be judged in the future by human beings than by how they will be judged by a God in a supernatural life, afterlife. Susan B. Anthony could not have been more wrong. I'm going to close because I want to leave plenty of time for questions. But those of you who have heard me speak before know that I rarely talk about my personal life. I keep that for my books and not much of that either. However, I'm going to make an exception tonight because it's so pertinent to what I mean when I say the acceptance of the finality of death is a crucial point in the conscience of a free thinker or an atheist. Seven years ago, my longtime partner died of cancer. He had Alzheimer's disease. But fortunately, the cancer killed him before he entered the final stage of that terrible disease in which all cognition and, cogn and consciousness vanish. During the last months of his life, I often wrote him letters because he found it easier to absorb things when they were written down than spoken. This isn't true of everyone with Alzheimer's, but it was true of him. Here is an excerpt from a letter I wrote him after we had gone to a movie. As it turned out, the last movie he would ever see. This is what I wrote, in part. Only a few weeks ago, when we saw that movie starting out in the evening, the one starring Frank Langella, I was deeply moved by a line in which he was describing his love for his former life. She lived in my heart, he said, and I never found that again. Well, you are the only person who has ever really lived in my heart, and that will be true long after you are gone, until my last moment of consciousness on this earth. We don't believe in life after death, you and I, and we know we're not going to meet some day again in a place with puffy clouds and harps, although if there were such a place I would like Harpo Marx playing the harp. <laughs> we have no children together, so the memory of the love we have won't go on in that way either. But I deeply believe that love is never wasted, and whatever good comes from it, we have passed on in some way to others, in everything from books to perhaps a greater tenderness than either of us might have shown without the other. Now we have only the moments of time we have, and we must use them as best we can. I'm glad I saved a copy of this letter.
because it brings back all of the conversations Aaron and I had during those last months while the light of his mind was dimming but not yet extinguished. I know that the memory of what I was able to do to help him rests only with me. Well, now a small part with you, but it doesn't matter. It seems to me that the very essence of the atheist and humanist concept of morality, a concept limited to what we do here on earth, is that love is never wasted even though it is not eternal. Our acts, good and evil, become a part of the world that will continue after us as long as the world continues. There is a grandeur in this view of life, as Darwin said at the end of his great work, which truly changed our view of ourselves. But there is also a proportional humility in this view of life, the knowledge that this is our one and only life, a span between the unconsciousness that precedes and follows our short existence. This knowledge, without bitterness, is what lies at the heart of the atheist and humanist conscience. Thank you. Okay. So my question is, uh, what are you working on now, or what book is coming out next that we can look forward to? Well, I'm really glad you asked that, since, uh, since although you can't sell books on this campus now, uh, it's a book called Religious Conversion, A Secular History, and uh, it limits itself to Western civilization for obvious reasons. There are too many thousand-page books in the world that you can't lie down and read. Uh, and it begins with Saul on the road to Damascus, and it ends in, in America, the American religious marketplace, a phrase used only here. It will be out roughly 11 months from today. I just turned the manuscript in a month ago. Traditional publishing, that is hardcover publishing, still takes uh, almost a year. Books that actually get edited and don't just get put online without editing and rewriting and so forth. But it will be about, it'll, it'll be published end of next February, beginning next March. Question on this side. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned in your talk about all arguments essentially boiling down to one person's moral value system versus another's. Is there, do you think, a value in having those conversations? Can it be constructive even if it is to opposing moral values? Can you speak? You know, that is a re that, that is a really good question, and I think about it a lot. Uh, and I was thinking about it during the panel of the religious people this morning about religion and morality, which I thought was wonderful, but a little bit too polite. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't. You know, you would never know from this panel that actually Jews and Christians, and there, there are there. It doesn't mean to say that we aren't all, that they aren't all good people, but that there are actually real thought differences. I think that discussions of people with opposing values can be valuable if the people aren't crazy. I, no, no, I, I, mean that, I mean that quite seriously. There are some discussions, like the kind of person, for instance, who murders a doctor who performs abortion. Uh, there would be no point in having such a discussion. But I have been at meetings, for instance, with women who had quite different views on abortion, they may not, nobody may have changed their minds, but they did learn a better appreciation of the other person's point of view. Uh, I will tell you that I also think some of the things, I never, for instance, I never do debates when invited to about the existence of God, because it's simply, I, I consider there's some questions which are ridiculous. There is no proof that God exists, and I would never be dumb enough enough to say that I can prove that God does not exist in that kind of a field, as the physicists say. You can't prove something so big. So I think that there is no value in kind of macro discussions like that. But I do think there is a value in people talking who have different views about abortion and the death penalty and multiculturalism. But I also, conversation just, I hate, I, I don't know, any of you watch Morning Joe ever? Some of you. Well, they always talk about the conversation as though the conversation itself is really important. And a conversation, to me, has to imply some kind of willingness at least to see the other person's point of view, if not to change your mind. A lot of what's called conversation in our society today is really two people just standing up and presenting their points of view and that's it, and not listening to the other person at all. And that's a kind of, a kind of whole other topic. I think in part that 
uh, although the internet can be a tool for people exchanging views, it can also be it, it can also be just a view for just people shouting, you know, the equivalent of a great big shout uh, and no possibility for exchange at all. Before you go, sir, we have a Twitter question. Uh, real simply, at what age did you discover atheism or realize you were an atheist? Ah, that's in my new book, but I, I, I have to answer. Uh, I began, certainly the fact that I went to Catholic school did have something to do with my becoming an atheist. I didn't discover atheism when I was, say, under the age of 10. But I did, a lot of the things that I was taught in school did not make sense to me. Uh, and the kinds of simplistic answers that the nuns gave. Like, like once I asked uh, the, whole, the Holy Trinity, you know, which people used to murder each other over, quite a lot of hundreds of thousands of people, that's in my book, The Era of the Reformation. But, uh, you know, when the nuns would say there are three persons and one God and explain it like it was like a shamrock, uh, and I, I remember saying, well, but there are four-leaf clovers. Why aren't there four persons in one God? And the priest called up my mother. And uh, I came from a kind of unusual family. But my mother said, you know, that doesn't seem to me to be such a stupid question, which wasn't so. I, I grew up in a family with kind of double messages. Yes, we're teaching you this, but you can think for, your, you can think for yourself. Uh, I think that I really... Uh, certainly, I think I've been an atheist in terms of being aware of what not believing in God from the age of 13. A lot of that had to do, I read Anne Frank's diary when I was 11, and in it she had, there's the famous line, I still believe that people are really good at heart. Well, I don't. Uh, and, and I didn't, when I read that, and, and it, it started me, at that point there was very little really known about the Holocaust, it's not like today. And I started, you know, reading more about it, and the whole, it really was for me, I didn't know the word theodicy then, but the problem of evil was why I became an atheist, and I certainly haven't believed in God since I was 13 or 14. Over here? I think she was first, if you want to. Go cool, ahead. great. So um, you mentioned at the end of your talk um, just things about love and about the death of your partner. Um, that's, I think, central to the movement, you know, the love and connection. Have you written more about that? No, I'm not much. Of, I'm not. My books are, are generally about others in history. They're they're not about me. And uh, I, I have to say that. Uh, I, I mean, I think the the idea, for instance, the stereotype of the atheist as a mean person, which you encounter all of the time. I remember. Do you know one of the things that's most useful when I get invited to speak? I get invited to speak at a lot of religious colleges, not things like Jerry Falwell, but historically religious colleges which are a whole different thing. They, they teach the history of secularism as well as religion. They, and they don't just have faculty members of their own religion. But one of, I found one of the most useful things I do is just show up wearing lipstick. I can't tell you. This has to do with the idea of the atheist as a mean, nasty person. I can't tell you how many young women have come up to me at these colleges and said, oh, you know, I thought of atheists. And feminists, there used to be this stereotype of feminists, too. People were all feminists because they were ugly women who couldn't get a man. And I think that there, that there is sometimes, like atheists are atheists because they're misogynists, you know, who don't like other people and whom other people don't like. So, I mean, it seems, it's, it's funny, but, but it's really true that there are a lot of stereotypes of the atheists as misogynists in, in that, I, that I think you're right. However, uh, this, this story I told, it was really about the attitude toward death, but I'm also very... Uh, very much averse to the, I think, heavily internet-driven thing of people feeling they have to tell everything about their personal lives uh, to, to have it almost an authenticity. I can't believe some of the things that people put on the internet about their personal life because I don't know why you would want strangers to know that. I thought a lot before putting that in this speech, but I do think it's very relevant to the point I was trying to make. But I don't think atheists need to go around saying, oh, well, I have children 
children. You know, I have a husband. I have a wife. Uh, I've been in love. I mean, I think the way you live shows that. And if, if people don't accept that, well, too bad for them. I'm not obliged to write an op-ed piece in the New York Times saying, you know, if you prick me, do I not bleed? <laughs> Over here. Hi there. Hello. Um, I uh, thank you. Just a delightful uh, presentation. Just uh, enjoyed it immensely. I've got uh, my daughters here, seven and uh, ten. So uh, we'll have a little chat with this. They're uh, still awake. They are. So we'll, we'll have a. They're like, I don't know what she said at all. So. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> well, you know, I want to ask uh, about the. I want to ask about the glue republic. Uh, you know, so it's you know, say what you will. But it's been, you know, religion has been, you know, kind of the uh, cohesive force of republics almost from the beginning. Um, you know, and then you just kind of rift a little bit about the internet. It does seem like everything is up for grabs now in terms of, you know, how people end up <clears throat> forming allegiances and how they end up kind of, you know, really anywhere across the globe in, in a couple of clicks here. I think this fellow over here is uh, connected uh, halfway across the world. Uh, but uh, so in terms of, you know, what that means for the United States, for republics in general, like if people can just bond together um, based on you know shared interests so that's you know uh, historically been you know the things that you know it, it's, it, I think there's going to be okay so we've had a black president there's going to be a lesbian Asian president everything before uh, an atheist president that'll be the last one so if you could just talk a little bit about that well, everything, uh, an acknowledged atheist president. Uh, we, we, have, we have had a lot of presidents who were anything but conventional religious believers. And I don't know, by the way, I don't agree that religion has been the glue of the republic. Uh, I, I really don't agree with that at all. Although Americans are, Justice Douglas was right, Americans are a religious people. Uh, I do, I really do think that there is a lot of evidence that the reasons religion hangs on more in America than it does in secular Europe is that we did always have the separation of church and state. Yes, honored sometimes more in the breach than others. But in Europe, when you changed your religion, it always meant changing your political religion. Here you could change your religion and still be an American. Again, there were, were some exceptions, but I, I would say that even though most Americans uh, professed a religion until, man, many more until fairly recently, uh, I would say that the glue of the Republic is that nobody was forced to practice a religion or one religion. I do agree that that an acknowledged atheist that before an acknowledged atheist would ever be president, we have got a lot of more work to do. And I suppose the love connection and all of that is, uh, is probably part of it. But there is, you know, you said we've had a black president, we'll have a woman president. Maybe, you know, we, you know, the fact is, we have had only two presidents who weren't white Protestant males. We've had one Catholic president, and who was probably one of the most secular presidents in our history. And we have now had one black president, and don't hold your breath you know, for, for, for another black president soon. And we may have one woman president. Uh, uh, but uh, I, 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 don't think, I, I don't think the idea that any of these prejudices against others, one of the things you could say for a long time is a certain kind of Protestantism was the glue of the ruling class, if you will, in America. But I don't think religion was the glue. I think this country would have fallen apart if, if we had had what was debated very vigorously at the time of the Constitution ratification. If we, if we, had, you know, if we had adopted a, a state-established church or even had a preamble to the Constitution which specified God as the source of all political power. The huge lie of the religious right is that this was founded as a Christian nation. No, we were a majority Christian Protestant people and the fact that this country's government wasn't founded as a Christian government is what made it distinct. It's what made it the first. It's what made it unique for a long time. And I don't think the fact that a lot of Americans were religious was, was necessarily the glue. 
before we go over here, we have a Twitter question, and it comes in two parts. And I want to stress, Susan, that a you... two-part tweet? <laughs> yeah, I suppose. You have the right to nix the first half of this if it's too personal. Um, okay. <laughs> so the first half is, how did you deal with the loss of your husband? And the second half is, how do you think the atheist community can be better at comforting people who have experienced loss? Ah, uh, I, will, I will skip the how I dealt yeah. with the loss of my partner, not my husband. <laughs> uh, but I think that... that one of the one of the things religion has to offer is is yes consolation in grief not only philosophically but humanly in terms of institutions uh, when you go to church and and the minister or the priest reads the names of parishioners who have died uh, it's an acknowledgement I think that religion is a community that that intrinsically provides some support for people in grief I think that this is that this is a problem uh, but I'm not sure how, I mean, for example, I don't know if I want support in my grieving from a community of atheists. I want it from my friends, but if my friends are atheists. But this, but, but, but this, but this is a problem. And I actually wrote something about this. I was very upset by President Obama's speech at Newtown after the Newtown shootings. Uh, not because he mentioned God, but because I, I will certainly give a president a pass on mentioning God to a lot of people who are religious believers who've lost their children. I had no problem with that. I had a real problem with his not only mentioning God, but talking about Jesus as the great consoler when there were many people who had lost their children in that audience who were not Christians and some who were not believers. And I thought, this is so unnecessary. He could have simply said whether we believe in a God or not. Uh, he didn't need to say, uh, uh, for you atheists who don't believe in eternal life, your children are, you know, no, that's not what he should have said. But he could have acknowledged simply that, 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 that not everybody is going to get consolation from Jesus, that we have to get consolation uh, from, from other sources. And I think that idea, uh, people, people ask me that uh, when my partner had Alzheimer's disease. They said, how can you get through this without religious faith? To me, I can't imagine imagine how I could have gotten through it with religious faith because that theodicy problem which first occurred to me when I was 12 or 13 if I had to believe in a God and reconcile that God with somebody who intelligently designs a brilliant person to lose their mind I don't know how uh, how I could do it so I think that there are some things that are a natural comfort in atheists and I was just talking about this with a friend of mine who's 80 years old who who recently lost his wife and he said exactly exactly the same thing and to the same horrible disease but I think that I think that mechanisms to re acknowledge people's grieving it is something that our movement does not really have and it's because we're not we're not a church uh, and I don't really know what the answers for this are but that that is a really good question and I think it is a real problem not that I think atheists have more trouble coping with grief than anybody else does but I do think that that uh, but it's something that needs to be, you know, community groups of free thinkers and so on need to be need to be mindful of that, uh, because certainly help and grief is one of the selling points of religion. <laughs> Question whether here. Whether it works, I couldn't say. Question here. Hi, thanks for coming tonight. I just have a quick question about difficulties related to being openly atheist. Now, I, I know that because of your career, um, being openly atheist is all part of it, but could you comment on um, some strategies that somebody could maybe incorporate into how they go about doing that when being openly atheist might be you know, nearly the equivalent to professional suicide? I'll tell you something. Uh, I can comment on it, but don't in any way 
take this as advice. Because I, one of the values of writing shorter pieces while I'm writing my book is I get a lot of feedback on my author website. And in that piece that I wrote after Newtown, I also, I mentioned the reluctance of people to identify as atheist. And compared it, in fact, I, I saying that I think if more people would identify as atheists, people would realize, as many have come to about gays, that gays aren't this group out there, that they are your son and your daughter, your neighbor down the street, the colleague you work with. If people always stay quiet about being an atheist, that's why I would say, they, if people stay quiet about being an atheist, uh, those young women at college can go on thinking that atheist women never wear lipstick or makeup or anything like that, uh, if you know what I mean. But I was brought up short uh, after that. I, the Dallas Morning News re-ran the piece on Sunday a week, a week later. They gave over the whole op-ed page to it. And I got, boy, a lot of interesting letters from atheists in Texas. But one of them was from a woman who lived in a suburb of Dallas. And she said he, she and her husband were atheists. But they did not say so because they knew their children would be bullied at school if their parents were known to be atheists. And I am sure that she was right. She said that they call themselves Unitarians because that's the closest church you know, that represents their belief. But I can't say, it is real easy for me to say, sitting in New York City as a writer, where the truth is, if I had children, which I don't, but if I had children, children aren't bullied in the New York City schools for being an atheist. They're bullied for other things, but for the most part, they're not bullied for being an atheist. So it doesn't take any great deal of courage on the Upper West or East Side of Manhattan to come out and say that you're an atheist. Uh, but there are a lot of places where it does take courage. And, and I don't know. I have not been faced with that problem uh, of being in a community where being an atheist is a real problem. Some people, a lot of the people who wrote me said that they're involved in internet groups, uh, you know, support groups like for atheists in small towns in the south and so on who are really afraid to, to you know, afraid that it would reflect on their employment, their husband's employment, their wife's employment. Uh, I will say this though, the internet in terms of making it more comfortable for atheists to live in the real world as opposed to the virtual world is not is not a solution that you're still hiding who you are and i i'm just reluctant i do think that more atheists need to come out but maybe maybe a natural way for instance if you're in an i i don't know if you're in an office, for instance, where some people would be offended, nevertheless, you might have a friend who's religious, who, but who is a friend, and who could talk, you could talk to. In other words, instead of, for example, several people wrote me, said that, you know, for they, from larger cities in the South, and the first thing when somebody moves from the South to South from the North that happens is people say, what church do you go to? And if you don't have a church, they invite you to church. They don't do this to be mean. They do it because it's a compliment. They're showing they want to be your friend. And a couple of people said that, you know, when they became friendly with people, they talked and said, well, you know, they didn't want to seem rude not to going to church, but they didn't go to church. And they said that they were surprised at how willing these were people they were already friends with it wasn't like they stood up in the office and said hey I'm an atheist but but they came out sort of slowly to people who were friends of theirs but whom they knew were religious believers that would be one way but I have to say it it, it does still in America take a certain amount of courage but I don't think that without that courage if we wish to live normal lives I really do think in this respect there is an analogy to the gay rights movement in the sense that no gay person, man or woman, can live a normal life pretending to be something else. If it's important to you and you are concealing a big part of yourself, then at the very least, it limits your friendships. But believe me, I don't minimize the effect 
in certain parts of the country, in a lot of places, in certain professional settings uh, of doing that. I'm not saying that it would be without cost. I think that there would be a cost, but maybe there's also a gain, as there certainly has for a lot of, you know, I come from an era where gay men and, and lesbians uh, still pretended they were something else, and certainly the people I know of my generation who came out 20 years ago are a lot happier than they would have been if they'd been living the way they were when we were young and everybody was still in the closet. So that's all I can say, but I, I don't want to make this sound like uh, I'm preaching about this because I'm not. I realize that it's a real serious issue. So this side again? Oh yeah, thanks. Sue, uh, that was a great talk, and I wanted to get back to what you said about uh, the Germans and Hitler, because um, that's one of the first things I run into when I try to have uh, with family and friends and have a little bit of a friendly debate, or not so friendly, maybe. <laughs> or, yeah, I think they go with Hitler first about how he, uh, he was actually an Everybody atheist. Everybody goes with Hitler first, right. <laughs> yeah. So I, I was curious either about your favorite comebacks for that or maybe about how my, the other probably the n number one or number two one for an argument is how people actually eyewitness the resurrection. Like my dad's always saying, there's 500 people that were eyewitnesses. This is like good testimony. He's a lawyer. You know, that's all he needs <laughs> for evidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, think, I think I'll start with the Nazis, which is easier than the, than, than the recollection. First of all, when, when people seriously bring up that Nazi thing, first of all, I tell them, in fact, there was a difference between Hitler and Stalin. While Stalin actually did really try to destroy the Russian Orthodox Church, Hitler tried to make accommodations with such as his concord with the Vatican and his cooperation with, with, with the, the mainstream elements of the Lutheran Church. You could be a member of the Nazi party and a Christian, and many people were. The Wehrmacht wore the belt, got mittens. Uh, you could be uh, in the Nazi army and your belt buckle said, God with us. Uh, now, Hitler was raised as a Catholic. The point is not that Hitler believed in God. I, who knows what Hitler believed in. But the point is, is the Nazis actually cooperated with religion. They, were, they tried to co-opt religion and in many instances succeeded. There were, of course, brave people uh, who both, both, both in, in Italy in particular, Catholic clerics and lay people. In Denmark, the Lutheran Church was the only actual church that wasn't a splitter church like the confessing church in Germany. The Lutheran Church took a courageous stand when the Nazis tried to deport the Jews and, and the Bishop of Copenhagen read the letter saying it was the duty of Lutherans to oppose when, when, when God's own people, Israel, uh, when this is directed against them, it was the duty to oppose. This is the only church that did that. What happened mostly with, with the Catholics, individual Catholics who provided help was, in Italy they did it, the Vatican didn't give any help, but there were lots of individual priests and lay people and bishops too who did help. But uh, the fact is, 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 is in, in Nazi Germany, there were lots of people who maintained their, themselves as active Catholics going to church and were members of the party as well. The church, and, and even more, the church also never said, you can't be a Nazi and a Catholic. Whereas Stalin said, you can't be a communist and a Christian, but the church never said, you can't be a Nazi and a Catholic. I think, in fact, that is one of the, that is one of the main things for those who consider Pope Pius XII a terrible historical figure, that the church, that the church never, the church which is and was an organization of considerable international influence, never said, as the Bishop of Copenhagen did, it is a sin to do this. Never. Anyway, uh, so that's the Nazi argument, which is the Nazis wanted to co-opt and cooperate with religion. They didn't necessarily want to destroy it. About the 500 people who saw the resurrection, I guess that, that one, I mean, all ideas about the Bible are based on the fact that it must be true because somebody reported that somebody saw something. But, but that, the Bible, that the Bible is a third-hand account since we don't know who the authors of the Bible were. And I mean that not only in a philosophical sense now in America, the supposedly most religious country in the world, 
Repeated polls over the last 10 years have showed, shown that over half of Americans cannot name the four Gospels, which I actually find astonishingly, and half of Americans don't know that Genesis is the first book of the Bible. And these are good polls. They're Pew, the Pew polls are the gold standard of research on religion. So that that tells you something about what religion means and doesn't mean, but it also tells you a lot more about our level of cultural ignorance. I found those polls amazing, and at first I didn't believe them, but they've been repeated now. All right, we will take two more questions. You, and then you, and we have about In five your minutes. speech, you touched on free will, and you mentioned that most people have a lot of trouble with the idea that we don't have free will. And I never really had that, and I was wondering if you had any idea why that might be so confusing and disturbing to people. Well, if you've never, if you, if you've never had that, you're an interesting person, and we can talk <laughs> afterwards. But I think, I think actually the answer to that actually is fairly easy and fairly short. We are a vain species. <laughs> I think that we all have trouble accepting that there are even, forget about no free will, like Sam Harris believes, I think, uh, that even we have trouble not seeing ourselves as free agents because we are really proud of ourselves. We like to see ourselves, uh, we like to see ourselves as, uh, as being free and making moral choices out of our own great intelligence. And I don't really think that it's any different People were, people were really upset in the 19th century that they might be descended, as Robert Ingersoll said, from the Prince Orangutan and the Princess Chimpanzee instead of uh, the great noble houses of Europe. And I think it's the same thing. I think it's thinking even that you don't have as much free will as you think you do is a blow to a person's pride. I think, for instance, this is, this is one of the reasons it's hard to get old, despite all of the crap that's written about uh, the new old age and all that. I assure you, nobody likes getting old, but one of the reasons people don't like getting old is not that we're nearer death, although you, you get reminded of that, too, when you look at average life expectancy and all that. It's because it humbles you. The fact that you cannot, for instance, uh, that you've got a knee that doesn't go down the stairs the way it used to, it humbles you. It makes you feel less of a free agent. You have to think about that knee. And in the, but how much worse it would be to think that, uh, that I'm, the, the stuff I write isn't my own. It's all predetermined uh, from ages past. Of course, it's a blow to our vanity. That's what, that's what I think. Maybe you're less vain than most people. <laughs> and last question on the left side of the room. You mentioned the comfort, the human comfort that comes from being a part of a congregation, being surrounded by people who take an interest in your life and take care of you. Uh, what's your take on Sunday assembly and the other atheist church attempts? I, look, I, it's not for me, but I do think, and I, and I know a number of the people who are involved in this, I think, it's a, I think it's a very good thing, and I think it's particularly important because, uh, because it involves families and children, and that, I think, is really important because I think, first of all, I think parents particularly get a lot of flack. I know people who aren't religious who've sent their kids to Sunday school because they believe their kids should not, that it's like child abuse to have your kid grow up without religion. So I think for one thing, I think atheist parents need some support to, from other people who believe as they do that it is right to pass these values on to children. And I think also, atheists also need to decide what they want to do about teaching their children something about religion. Because this is, this is, this is a problem too in the sense that uh, if I had children, I would be very unhappy if they didn't know that Genesis was the first book of the Bible. So I think one thing that a parent can discuss with another atheist parent is how do you introduce at the appropriate age? Uh, this is part of our cultural heritage without suggesting that you believe in it. 
you know, uh, and I think that is something that things like Sunday assemblies and groups, uh, particularly focused on child rearing, I think that's a really necessary part of, of, of the movement. A warm round of applause for Susan Jacoby.